This episode of the Elevate Your Leadership podcast is brought to you in part by iFly Virginia Beach Indoor Skydiving. At iFly Virginia Beach, we bring people together through the dream of flight. To learn more about our leadership development and team building, visit iFlyVirginiaBeach.com. Welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast series with U.S. Navy Special Operations veteran, CEO, and hockey fanatic, Bob Pizzini. Bob discusses leadership, success, failure, defining moments, and hard lessons learned with guests who are intentional in their approach to leadership. Leadership is a perishable skill. Use it or lose it. In this series, entrepreneurs, industry executives, academics, public figures, and other highly effective professionals share their formulas for success with you. Welcome, everybody, to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast with me, your host, Bob Pizzini. I do this podcast because I encounter people who bring great value to me and my organization, and I want to share that that information with you so they can bring great value to you and your organization. And today's guest is probably one of the most experienced business people I've had on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Jeffrey Hazlett is not only a guest on podcast today, he's a personal friend and his business endeavors are something that I've been watching and trying to participate in for a long time. Jeffrey Hazlett is a primetime television host of C-Suite with Jeffrey Hazlett, an executive perspectives on C-Suite TV and business podcast host of All Business with Jeffrey Hazlett on C-Suite Radio. He is a global business celebrity, speaker, best-selling author, and chairman and CEO of C-Suite Network, home of the world's most trusted network of the C-Suite leaders, the company he founded in 2014. Hazlett is most widely known for being a business trendsetter and successfully leading through the transition of one of the largest corporate turnarounds of a Fortune 100 company as the chief marketing officer of Eastman Kodak. In that role, Hazlett helped the company reinvent the brand, embrace the emergence of new media, was one of the first corporate officers on Twitter and an early ambassador of digital marketing. Following his departure from Kodak, Hazlett made it his mission to help all types of businesses from Main Street to Wall Street transform themselves using the adapt, change, or die adage, a concept found in his best-selling book, The Mirror Test. He's constantly embracing new opportunities and finding creative solutions to steamroll obstacles. I like that steamroll. I, Being an explosive guy, I like to say I blow them up. I blow those obstacles up. Hazlett also serves on a dozen corporate boards, including DocuSign, and in-stream ad tech, and two publicly traded companies, Live World and Global Cannabis Applications Corporation. Hazlett is a Hall of Fame public speaker and author of four best-selling books, Think Big, Act Bigger, which I've read, The Rewards of Being Relentless, Running the Gauntlet, The Mirror Test, and The Hero Factor, How Great Leaders Transform Organizations and Create Winning Cultures. Jeffrey Hazlett, welcome to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Hey, good to, uh, good to be here, brother. Thanks so much for having me. I think we're about done after you read that whole resume. We're, <laughs> yeah. we're done. There's yeah, no more exactly. time for the no more time for the interview. We're over. That just shows your your depth and breadth of experience in in you know all things business, really, which is how you and I got to know each other. But I have to say, I know Jeff on a personal level. I've been to his house. I've met everybody in his family, and it's in addition to being all things business, he's also all things very personable and very personal, and is genuinely interested in other success. And I, I, again, I say that from experience. Jeffrey, let's start with Eastman Kodak, if you don't mind. What an incredible story. Can you just kind of tell us how your experience with Eastman Kodak ended? I, I resigned. I just decided to leave. You know, I, I typically, the longest I'd ever been in any company was a couple of years. You know, when you're when you're the chief marketing officer of any kind of major company or doing what you're doing at that level, The average length of tenure was like 18 months for a CMO at a company of that size. And of course, there I was four years and four years in. I didn't think I'd stay more than two years and uh, I stayed four. And that's the longest I'd stayed at any corporate gig period. So for me, it was just I was done. I did what I was supposed to do. 
And, you know, I have three rules for engagement around what I call condition of satisfaction is I got to build wealth. Okay. For me and my family, that's how we keep score. You know, uh, second, I got to have fun. And third, I got to learn from it. And, you know, I was meeting two of those, not three. Um, you know, I wasn't having as much fun in it because, um, just the way the organization was put together, how it was done. And, you know, I had some, I mean, did I have fun in it? Yeah, absolutely. But it wasn't getting me where I wanted to go. And I was ready to move on to my next level of my own kind of development. You know, in hindsight, there's lots of times I wish I'd have stayed, you know, because, uh, the money was really good. I'd never made as much money in my life as I made in corporate, but, you know, it just wasn't for me anymore. So I just went to the boss one day and said, I'm, I'm resigning. You know, I said, I'd like to leave in May. I got a book coming out in May and you're not going to let me have the book and, you know, launch the book and keep the job, you know, cause that's just the kind of the nature of the corporate world. So that we just decided to work it out. And I got, I pay, I guess I had severance, not severance pay, but whatever you call it, earned pay uh, vacations, all that. And I got paid through September, which was really helpful. But outside <laughs> of that was it. Okay. I didn't take right. any, I didn't take any parachute. No, no sexy contracts, nothing like that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. Just, uh, just moved on. Now that's interesting because you were there when the digital revolution hit and Eastman Kodak yeah. went through one heck of a transition, but you're right. The average chief marketing officer is the shortest lived officer in the C-suite. Uh, I think you said 18 months. And uh, I think I recall reading a, a Harvard Business Review article to that effect. So. Yeah, it's now it's now a lot more, a lot greater than that's uh, like well over two years now. But but uh, back then it was a really dangerous position. It was kind of like dead CMO walking. You, hey. know, I, you know, in fact, my CEO used to, when I walked by, used to say, I see dead people. I see dead people. <laughs> that could be the next mini series, dead CMO <laughs> walking. Dead so. CMO and then obviously you've developed the C-suite network into an incredibly large and capable organization, um, all things business. I've been a member of the C-suite network for, I think, just over three years now. And I know that I have grown personally and professionally as a result of my membership there. And in the process, you wrote a few books. I've yep. read Think Big, Act Bigger. Your books are leadership centric, at least think big, act bigger is obviously the hero factor is when it comes to leadership, what is your foundation? What are some guiding principles, some things that are in your conscious mind in tools of leadership that you put to use on a regular basis? Oh, well, first of all, it's around values. You, you know that. I mean, in everything, you know, in leadership, it's always about the grinding, your, you know, grounding yourself in values. First, that's first and foremost. You got to you have a got a good sense of who you are, what you want. What do you want to be? you know, or at least some direction of that, you know, because we're constantly challenged. If you think you have the answers when you step into the C-suite, you're wrong. Our job isn't to be the smartest person in the room. Our job is to be the most strategic person in the room. And so that means many times I got to say, well, I don't know the answer to this, but it's, but but my values and my experience and all the things that lead up to it will guide me. But that's the first one in terms of tools. The, the next kind of tools is to listen to shut your mouth and listen, Without you know, a doubt. Yep. you know, you know, cause we could tell stories and everybody, and by the way, when you're in the C-suite, everybody's you're yesing you, you know what I mean? Yes, I, luckily I've got a team that nobody <laughs> says yes to me at all. <laughs> Everything's a fight to get it accomplished, but that's okay. Cause it's better than what I stepped into it, but that, you know, so listening is the thing, you know, some, at least some clear direction of where you want to go. So values, listening and, and having a direction of where you want to take it. And by the way, it doesn't mean you're going to get there. It means you're just going to be on the journey in the way that you want it to be in, in the direction you think you want to go, because that direction will change over time. Yeah, that is the most uh, sage advice right there. Again, as an owner of a company with 35 people, setting that cardinal direction and making sure everybody sees it and everybody knows it is critical, but there's deviations, right? We, oh, we try we, yeah, every we day. Try and, yeah. We try and stay on course, but there's deviations. As long as we know what that cardinal direction is, we can adjust to it. Well, you think about this, think about a plane that that's flying uh, across country. It has to constantly make deviations because of the jet stream, the weather, the wind, uh, you know, other planes coming <laughs> at the same level that you're, you're flying. You got to make constant deviations to it. That's life, man. 
And yeah. uh, certainly without question, that's business because I've never seen a business plan work the way it's supposed to yeah. ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ever. Or, right. you know, you know, yeah, I, I think it's going to be from this to this. I, I have a slide in my early slides. I still use it. It goes what we think the plan looks like. And it's a straight arrow from one point A to point B, you know, up in the upper right hand quadrant from the lower left straight arrow up, you know, across the board. That's what we think. And the next slide is what it really is. And it's a squiggly line that goes everywhere until it finally gets to that point, you know, um, and that's usually the way it is. And that's OK. You just have to understand that's the game. Yeah. As long as you're tracking, generally tracking in, in the uh, intended direction. So you have three. Kind uh, of- you know, this as long as you you mean, you're a former ordinance officer, you know, <laughs> working with explosive and everything, as long as you don't get blown up. We're winning, man. Yeah, <laughs> winning. that's right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, after a career in, in Navy Special Operations, uh, I've been fortunate in that regard and took a lot of lessons from that. So you have some some foundational principles that you put forth in exercising your leadership. One of them you said was listening. And I couldn't agree more. The more you listen and, and, and really the more you let others talk, kind of talk through it. There's so many different ways to listen, levels of listening questions you can ask to engage, you know, people to uh, continue to talk. I think it's a real valuable tool in leadership, one that really, I would say a lot of leaders don't exercise enough. Regarding your book, The Hero Factor, you talk about building cultures. And I think listening to your teammates is critical to building cultures. What tools do you use or how do you build a positive culture in an organization. It always comes down to the one thing that that's a theme in all the podcasts that I do interviews with. As you know, I have a all business with Jeffrey Hazel right here on C-Suite Radio. You're on C-Suite Radio along with 500 plus other great podcast shows on this network. But the one common theme that when I talk to CEOs from all different size companies is talent. And so it's trying to find the right kind of people first of all, because that's what makes great cultures is, is, you know, when we talk about cultures, I mean, like, let's say I'm, I'm a Kodak, I'm Kodak, you're Kodak, everybody that works at Kodak and collectively we're Kodak. That's the culture of Kodak. So if you, if you want to great build great cultures, you start with great teams and great kinds of people who are open to doing the things in a way that you want to like, like part of a family that, but that means you've also got to have different kinds of family members too. So you get, you got some that are more rigid, some that are more open. So different personality types, it it makes all kinds, but the one common theme, you know, or, you know, thing that they all have is the aspect of winning that aspect of serving that aspect of you know, the things that are important to you in terms of your values as a company. So shared values um, is right up there uh, in terms of making sure I got the right culture. Yeah, making sure you have the right people. And for me, it's moral and ethical character. You know, when we interview, yep. we don't interview for the, the, the specifics of the skill set. We interview really for moral and ethical character more than anything else. And yeah, I want to know what they're like. Yeah, you know, what do you do for fun? How do you do it? Uh, I ask them things like, "What's your stand on the Second Amendment? What's your stand on the First <laughs> Amendment?" Things like that. Just, just not because I, you know, they look. I've got people who are vastly different than me in my team in terms of politics, how we raise our kids, the way in which we do certain things, and that's okay. I would just. But they're, they're, they're solid in the way they do it. And that's, that's, you know, that moral, ethical character you were talking about. Man, that's just spot on. You know, somebody I can trust. And, you know, trust has three components to it. One is sincerity. And that's hard. That's a hard one. Are they sincere? Do they have that moral backbone that you talked about in terms of being very sincere? Then the other two pieces are really around competency and reliability you know, and really where I want to put my trust factors around that sincerity. And I can find out whether you're reliable or you're competent. Like you can be, you can be late on every project, but yet still be competent. You can, you can be, um, you know, early on everything and never be competent. (laughs) You know, those are the kind of things I look for in terms of uh, the trust factor. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Three components of trust. Sincerity, competency, and reliability. Within my leadership model, I have this little XY chart, performance versus behavior. And, um, you know, I've, I've been blinded by really good performance where the behavior was lacking, or in other words, the moral and ethical character was not what it should have been. Got to cut that. 
Got to yeah. cut that. I mean, that when you start seeing stuff like that, you just go, nope, done. You know, yeah. you, you learn. I mean, I was having a conversation with someone, another CEO, and you know, they're having a trouble with, with one particular executive. And it's just constant. I said, why are you putting up with that crap? You know, I mean, yeah. yeah, well, he's performing. Well, I, so what, you know, I have a sign outside my door. This is no drama zone. Don't bring that mess in here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't want that. I'm done with that in my life. I, if you, if you, if you bring more drama than your, you know, your value, you're gone. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Gotta be yeah. gone. Yeah. So one of the things I came up with is, you know, does, does the value outweigh the pain in the ass factor or does the pain in the ass factor outweigh the value? And same thing. If the pain in the ass factor outweighs the value, see you later. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but I was, you know, I made the mistake of hanging on and, and I've talked to so many business owners and you're probably one of them who, you know, yeah. And when they let them go, things immediately get better. And everybody asks the question, what took so long? Yeah. What and, took so long? Yeah, yeah. Like, Oh, like, well, thank you. I always call Tyco T Y C O. Thank you. Captain obvious. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's what yeah. I was thinking. Everybody. Cause like everybody else will, you know, you could have stepped up, help make that decision at any time. Yeah, you know? ex exactly. Right, right and down to, right down to uh, the captain of the ship. You know, the worst ship in the navy. Uh, that was an yeah. interesting story. So he, Ex uh, exactly. Yeah. He, you know, you take a you take a team that's existing. So it, you know, wherever I've gone in, I've never replaced the whole team. I've never replaced a lot of put, put players. I might pick one or two. You know, I could. Kodak, I mean, it's 7,500 marketing people working in the company and, you know, it's a lot of people. Uh, did I replace a few? Yeah, without question. But my core team, I inherited and that team stayed with me, you know, for the most part, you know, and, and one, it was interesting. One of the greatest compliments I ever had was a, was a CMO, of one of our business units. They started making changes to everything and, and the president of the division uh, one of our, our you know, chief operating officers for, we had one for the consumer, one for B2B. And he said, what's the one change that, that occurred in the way in which you guys are operating and the success that you're having? He said, it's Jeff Hazlett, because <laughs> I was, I was clearing the way for all these guys, you know, to, to do what they needed to do here. They were underperforming, but there were these red flags that were getting in the way of them doing their jobs. And so my job was to focus on what's the red flags, what's the red flags. I mean, it because usually nobody wakes up every morning and says, I can't wait to be stupid. Right. <laughs> you know, there are a few of those people and you know who they are. And that's the ones you got to get rid of. That's the ones you got to replace, yeah. you know, that are just impediments. They're just they're asses, you know, they're they're yeah. whatever, you know, they just can't get narcissist, whatever. They can't get out of the way. And we all, we have people like that. We all have people like that on the team and, yeah. and you gotta, and you gotta find those because they're, they're just leeches. They're just the energy suckers. You know, they just won't, they won't get on the bus and drive. So Sue Bingham calls them the 5%. Yeah. yeah. I love yeah. Sue. Sue, Sue, yeah. Sue nails them. Right. And there are those people like that. That happens all the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. Her book, the high performance workplace, she talks about, you know, 95% of the workforce is there to do a good job. They're of high moral and ethical character and, the HR manuals and all the rules are written for the 5%, which ultimately makes it difficult for everybody else. It's a, it's a great theory she's got. You know, you talked about clearing the way, and that's actually one of our mission kind of sayings, if you will, in Navy EOD is we clear the way, right? We enable yep. others to, to be able to access areas that were previously denied by enemy explosives or other, other types of devices. So clearing the way. And that's really what a leader's job is. That kind of goes to my definition of leadership. You know, I have a two word definition, which is enabling others. So my job is mm. to enable others to accomplish their objective. And, um, and for me, that's, I mean, that's what, that's what we do as leaders. That's yeah. what, you know, I mean, that's what we do. My job is to, you know, there was a Steve Napolitan is one of our uh, thought council members here at the C-suite network leads his own mastermind organization. And he, he, he has this great thing, automate, delegate, or eliminate, <laughs> you know, and I love that. I write it down every day. What can I automate? What can I eliminate? What can I delegate? And by delegating, it really means how do I have, you know, how do I help others do their job? And I learned this years ago, you know, when I was on a construction site back when I was in high school, and I was working construction, just any job. I was one of the guy that cleaned up the site. You know, that's my job was to go to the site and clean up. And the boss stopped by one day and he said to me, he says, uh, hey, Jeff, I want you to be thinking about this. But next week, I'm going to come back to you and I'm going to ask you, what can I do to help you do your job better? 
Well, I said, I can answer that right now because I was yeah. ready to tell him, I, I, I won't give me more money. Right. <laughs> and 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 he, he goes, don't no, no, don't answer it now. He said, uh, I'll come back and a week later. He came back and he, I said, pay me more money. And he and he goes, well, I thought you might say that. He said, that's not the answer I was looking for. He says, because if you do a great job of paying more money, there's no doubt about it. But again, I want you to think about what I could do to help you do your job better. Oh, I thought it was there. Okay. So now I had to think. So for a week I was writing down stuff. Like I need a bigger wheelbarrow. If I get this one kind of broom or if I get a blower, you know, that kind of stuff I was thinking. And then, uh, then he came back, I gave him all that. And he goes, that's great. I'll let's go do this. Let's go do this. And that always stuck with me. So one of the things I always do when I meet with team members is say, Hey, what can I do to help you do your job better? What can yeah, I help yeah. you? What can I enable you to be better? How can I, add, I call it adding zeros. You know, I say that in business, there's no difference uh -huh. between a business in main street and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where I'm from, or on wall street, where I've also come from, there's no difference in the side, no difference in the way you operate those businesses, just zeros. Yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, I learned that a long time ago. Cause my, my father-in-law is a farmer. And rancher, he, you know, he said, how do you deal with that? And you go from this business that was millions now to business that's billions. How do you deal with it? I said, I just take the zeros off. You know, I'm <laughs> trying to make the decision. Is it, was it, is it a good thing in Sioux Falls, South Dakota? If I had, you know, had this little business there, would this be a good decision if I take all the zeros off? And if the answer is yes, I usually do it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tool, actually to enhance business operations or yep. to, that's interesting. You know, your story of cleaning up the construction site in high school reminds me of one of my very first assignments in the Navy. I was in this transient unit awaiting transfer to one of my, one of the schools very early in my career. And they put me in charge of the parking lot. You know, they said, you're in charge of that parking lot, make sure it stays clean and it's well kept, et cetera. And the history of that was whoever was in charge of the parking lot would go out there and pick up cigarette butts. Well, yeah. I went out there and, you know, the cigarette butt detail took about 20 minutes and then there's the rest of the day. I noticed the lines were fading. I thought that there could have been different lines in different locations. There was gravel and loose dirt and dust. I went back and I asked for brooms and I asked for paint and paintbrush. And I asked for, they're like, who the hell do you think you are? You're the junior guy who just got here. And I go, well, you want me to take care of that parking lot? I want to do a good job and I need some I, I need to make some improvements out there. So, you know, it, it, it's something. And by the way, we all have to watch this. I mean, look, I, I serve as officer for a lot of different companies I'm involved in. Some of them, I got some hands on, meaning I really am running things. But then sometimes somebody else will come with the same thing that's kind of under my purview. And I'm like, wait a second, that's my job. But then then I got to remind myself, hey, that is my job. My job is to help this guy do it better. And, you know, but we think that way sometimes you're like, or who is this young, who's this young Turk think he's doing this crap? You know, like when, when we should be saying, yeah, bring on this young Turk. Right. Exactly. So, exactly. And, and by the way, we have to, we have to look at ourselves sometimes inward, right. To see how we can, how we can change that or in, and, and switch it around a little bit. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, I've been with my team here at iFly Virginia Beach for about eight years now. Uh, most most people on the management team. And I love it when they're one step ahead of me. Um, two steps, yeah. three steps. That's a, that's getting getting out a little too far in front. But uh, when they surprise me by being one step ahead of me on different things, you know, uh, and uh, uh, an example would be they'll come and say, hey, I think we should do this or we should do that. And I'll say, why didn't I think of that a year ago? Of course, yeah. we should do that. You know, yeah. I, that's something that I should have come up with, but, but I, I, I love that. And I think it's a very comfortable place to be as a leader when your team, when that dynamic, you know, when your team, they're comfortable having that discussion with you. Hey boss, let's turn left here. Let's turn right here. I need more budget. This, you know, Man, I love it. Yeah. I love it. Another thing I, for it, I, I refer to it as is challenging assumptions. You know, they'll come in and say, we don't think, you know, we know you want to do that. We don't think we should do that. And here's, here's our concerns about that. And it's just a, an open, honest discussion, no personality, no ego, you know, no agenda. It's everybody looking out for the best interest of number one, the organization, and number two, everybody in the organization. So I love it. I love to have more of that. And the more you have of that, the better it just makes you feel. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and a key to that, I think, is having a right hand man, if you will. The Navy, we call it an executive officer, but it's it's really having a relationship with somebody. And I'm going to ask you about your right hand man or woman 
after this commercial break. We're going to take a quick break for capitalism, folks. We are having a great discussion with Jeffrey Hazlett of the C-Suite Network and many, many other organizations. We'll be right back after this break for capitalism. And we are back. We're talking to Jeffrey Hazlett of the C-Suite Network. We left off talking about having a right-hand man or woman. Leaders need to have people that they can rely on and trust 100%. And when you have that, man, it is valuable. It is, uh, it's a nugget of gold, to say the least. Uh, Jeffrey, you know, I, you know, how do you handle that? Do you have uh, amongst your executive leadership team, do you have somebody that you leverage quite a bit? Yeah, I, well, without question, uh, in the C-suite network, it's it's Trisha Ben. I mean, she's everything. She's leading. She stepped up as a leader. I'm just stepping away. You know, now I'm just becoming more of the eye candy, and the day to day responsibilities that she's doing. You know, Carl Post, my other partner, with what he does with our professional services and everything that used to be a business called Tall Grass, and we've been gradually bringing that in into the C-suite. So I've got that on the marketing side, it's Tyler Hazlett, the chief marketing officer. So we got, each of us has a lane, right? That we kind of, we kind of, uh, operate in. A lot of folks have a lot of uh, good executive assistant. I did away with my executive assistant. Oh my goodness. I'm going to say about 10 years ago when I went to Kodak, after I left Kodak, I started doing it myself. And then all of a sudden all these apps started coming. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you could do oh, yeah. so much. You could do so much with apps like booking travel and other things that that I just it's easier for me just to get on and book travel. I, I don't book travel more than a week out in advance anymore. Hardly, you know, yeah. pay a little bit more for that. But I don't care what airline. I just grab what airline is most convenient, things like that. So, yeah, but on the but on the business side. The, those are the key individuals. And, you know, there's others in there as Ashley and my wife, Tammy, as well. There's others that we do, you know, different roles for different things. So, you know, referencing Tyler uh, as your chief marketing officer and Tammy, it's funny because my wife, Julie, participates in our business and she didn't for the first two years or so. Uh, uh -huh. she, has, she has her own career. You know, after a couple of years, I had to make some major changes uh, at the management level. Like I said, you know, the performance versus behavior thing. And we had to had to let some people go. And there was a trust factor that had to be rebuilt. And I thought one of the best ways to rebuild it was bring Julian, who obviously I trust 100 percent. That again, that was five or six years ago. And that turned out to be such a good move for the organization, the family aspect of it and her, her ability to put her heart into what she does uh, for the good of everybody on this team. It's something that I just wasn't planning on. And when it happened, man, it's magic. And family businesses can be can be disappointing at times, but I have to say it's been just wonderful for us. And I assume that's your experience as well. Yeah, it's, oh, I love working with family. It can be difficult sometimes. You know, my, my daughter's also worked with me as well. And she says she's quit and been fired five or six times, you know, <laughs> and, and I, I'm sure my, at least my son who works with me and my wife have a better disposition on personality. My daughter's more like me. So that's why she says what she says. Now she's doing her own startup, but you know, you have to, you know, if you have a family owned business uh, or a family in the business, there has to be a time when you're a dad or a husband or a wife or daughter. And then there's a time when you're the boss. For sure. And, and you got to separate those things and it's, and you have to do your best not to play, you know, that role all the time, like being a dad, you can't do that in business. Um, so you have to, I always like to try to put one person between me and them at any given time, because it, it gets frustrating. And, you know, I know me, I wouldn't be married to me and, <laughs> and my, you know, and my children probably say the same thing about me being their dad some days, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a pain in the rear end, but that's what you have to do as a dad sometimes. And, yeah, you know. no, you have boundaries. You have to have boundaries for sure. And then Julie and I discuss those from time to time, very deliberately, just to make sure that we're doing the right thing. We're staying on the same page and we're, we enjoy each other's company uh, when the workday's ended. So, you know, five, six years in so far, so good. I do have some clients, you know, I do a lot of consulting, um, business leadership, et cetera. And I've had a client, at least one client in the past who had a real problem with family, actually two clients, an active client and a client from the past who have a problem with family members in the business. And I can see where they're coming from there, where they feel that the family member who's essentially a coworker is this protected class or this protected status. And in one case, mm. it, 
Yeah, that doesn't. Yeah, that doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't work. work. Yeah. Um, sometimes you. Sometimes there is that. I mean, you know, you have a. Let's. And I know people who have been in a situation. They have a troubled uh, family member or some. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know. So everybody just needs to know that's what that person's role or something is, and you know, they're not going to produce at the same level. So don't judge them at the same level. Yeah. And that's that's what you've decided to as a boss or a an owner or, you know, a family member of that person, you've decided to do it this way. Well, then that's your conditions of satisfaction, but by and large, they're not protected. They're yeah. they're Yeah. They're, they're, they, they, they got it worse than everybody else does quite frankly. Yeah. I think if you're leading in a responsible fashion, that's very true. Unfortunately, not everybody does. And uh, that can really be poison amongst the team as well. If, even if the perception is there, even if they're not in a protected status, you know, some people may just automatically make that, make that assumption, which is not healthy and has to be fixed as well. We had, um, I had a, a young man who was an employee and he, he, his father's a very good friend of mine and we brought him on, but I, I call it going through the front door. You know, I didn't interview him, my management team, the person he was going to work for did the interview. They wound up bringing him on board. And it didn't take very long to realize that this young man was not a good fit at all. Yeah. But his yeah. manager thought because father and I are good friends, he did have this kind of, you know, protected status. And, you know, she came to me one day and she's like, again, it happened again. And I'm like, what's he still doing here? Yeah. And she's like, you mean I well, can fire him? I'm like, that's your course. buddy. Yeah. Well, like yeah. what? Yeah. Like yeah, what? Well, it's always amazing sometimes that people live in stories. They live in these stories of what they can or cannot do. And they're un they're just unfounded because they're ungrounded because they never had the condition of, of this condition of satisfaction discussion that you normally have in the process. Yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you, that was a learning time for me. Or that was a lesson learned for me because my assumption was she knew because I said time and time again, that's your department. You handle it however you want. Just tell me what you need. And when she came to me with this, you know, perception that he was protected, I was like, where does that come from? Yeah, but, get over that. Yeah, yeah, get over that. Yeah. But it was there. Yeah. So now that's something else that I have to kind of be conscious of is making sure that I, I don't give that impression or, or just making it more clear than I thought I did at the time. Uh, Jeff, we're at 30 minutes. We're coming up on drive time. You do have a new book coming out that I want to talk about real quick. It's all about using data or media. It's about, it's about your brand being essentially a media company. And I'm very interested and intrigued. And I think I'm, without reading your book, I think I'm moving in that direction already. But can you tell us a little bit more about what you got going on there? Yeah, it's called the brand of you. I, I want everybody to start looking at yourself as a media company, looking at everything you do, even if you're a company. Let's say you're a dry cleaner. You know, somebody said, well, I can't be a media company. Yeah, you can. You need to be the expert of spots. You should be the spot doctor or whatever it might be. You've got to be the expert in your community or your category to win. And used to be you could put ads in the, oh, this dates me, but the <laughs> yellow pages, all right? Used to be you put ads in the radio, on the radio. Used to be you put ads in the newspaper. Well, when was the last time you picked up those, listened to those? So now you've got to be a digital expert. Well, to be a digital expert, you got to drive content. And to drive content, you got to be a media company. So now you need to tell the story. So you can't just you can't just advertise because that's just not the way people are engaging anymore. What you have to do is create the content. So to sell you is to sell the business. Sell the business is to sell you. And I've been doing it since the days of when I was at Kodak, and I f figured it out very early. If I if I use me to sell my product, basically by tell the story, by creating the content, by naming the first chief officer, listening officer, the chief blogger of, of me going on Celebrity Apprentice and being a spokesperson for the company, making the company the, you know, the content in essence, well, then I could, I could grow. And so that, you know, I got named the celebrity CMO by Forbes magazine and put on the front cover and the whole bit. And that's when I realized, oh, oh I'm onto something here. Yeah. And now for 10, 12 years, I've been doing it and built it into a multi-million dollar business. And so and that's whether you want to be a thought leader, but take it away from a thought leader. Again, dry cleaning company or think about Bezos. Think about all these major CEOs. That's what they're doing now. They're creating content for their company to win and own the category. So if you want to own the category of whatever you do, 
think about it, then start writing about it, start being a thought leader around that, you yeah. know, start, start gaining, gaining haters, start gaining comments yeah. where people <laughs> go like, Oh my God, but you know, whatever it might be, it's okay for all that. That's important. Yeah. Thought leader. So, you know, you just helped connect something uh, for me. So thought leader, because now you hear these days, you hear about influencers, social media influencer, or, um, yeah. but I think thought leader is kind of varsity level or professional level. Yeah, there's a different level of it in terms of who they are. You know, you're really true. I call it a maven. You're a maven in that category. You know, we're all influencers in some way, shape, or form. Everybody's an influencer, right? You know, people around you, even if they're not getting paid, they're influencers because you, you know, if you, you know, think about how I might want to do this. You ask your friends, well, what'd you buy? How did, what did you like? How did you like that? You know, uh, where's a great place to eat? Well, you're not an influencer. A thought leader means that's where, people are citing you. They, they see you as that, that the expert in that particular area, not one of many. So you're a maven in the category. And yeah. that's, a, that's a lot different than being just an influencer. Yeah. Yeah. I would also, I would also add, it's been my experience uh, regarding thought leadership that um, people will make major decisions based on your thoughts or uh, you know, your approach to something being a thought leader, they'll, they'll seek your counsel or they'll already be familiar with your opinion or your approach to something and they'll make a major decision. Should I buy? Should I sell? Should yep. I hold, uh, et cetera, based on, on that very high level of influence that, that you're talking about. Uh, so be, the brand of you, I'm sorry, it's called. The brand of you. So all you got to do is reach out to me. Reach out to me at Jeff at csuitenetwork.com, c-suitenetwork.com, and I'll make sure you get a free download of that uh, book. That's yeah, what we're that's, doing. We're giving, we're giving it away. That's yeah, what we that's wanted. Incredible. It. Yeah. And I, I, I'll tell you the brand of you that's been my evolution over the last five or six years to the point to where my sales and marketing department and my business, they've actually come back and said, Bob, we need to, we need to get you out there a little bit more. We need to make a video of you doing this and doing that. We need you to speak at the, you know, the speaking engagements that you yeah, get well, think, yeah, at. Think about your iFly business. The more that you're out there, the more people know about it, the more people want to come, more people want to sign up. That's, that's, yeah. that's what you're in. That's what you're about to do. That's what you got to do these days. Yeah. Yeah. That's exactly right. I actually started a, a radio show here locally as well. You know, what's the iFly guy doing on radio talking about leadership and, uh, and it's a lot of fun. I'm having a blast. That, that's the way to do it. So folks, Jeffrey Hazlett, the C-Suite Network, amongst his many other holdings and endeavors. And if you ever get a chance to hear Jeff speak, he does speak professionally around the country, around, around the world, actually. But um, if you ever get a chance to just meet with Jeff, hear him speak, or have a look at the C-Suite Network and all the things he offers to build the brand of you amongst the other things, it will be worth your while. Jeff, thank you so much for being a guest on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. Is there anything that we didn't get to that you'd like to mention? Oh, man, I'm just excited. Anyone's welcome to come by. Again, email me at jeff at c-suitenetwork.com, c-suitenetwork.com. I'll invite you to our Friday celebrations. You know about that, Bob. You know, we get together every Friday as a C-suite network. Um, well, we get together for many meetings throughout the week. We got a meeting every single day, many meetings per day. But every Friday, it's a time for us to kind of get together. Kind of like when you, before COVID, you drive and meet with your buddies at the pub uh, at the end of the week, kind of celebrate or, you know, give a high five or, you know, pat in the back for a great week. Or maybe you needed a hug because the week really sucked, you know. And that's what we do every Friday. We get together and we'd love to have you come and join us online. We just do it virtually and we have you know, well over 100 or 150 people show up and maybe even a lot of times even more. And we just get together, do a breakout, do a few breakout in the room, get to meet other people and and do a little networking, which is awesome. It's a great format. I love the C-Suite Celebrates, it's called. So Friday, Friday evenings at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And please go to the C-Suite Network and uh, find C-Suite Celebrates, like, like Jeffrey said. We'd love to have you. And the new faces and new participation brings new life and new energy. It's a, it's a wonderful experience. Jeff, thanks so much for being on the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. And until next time, my friend, we'll see you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Elevate Your Leadership podcast. To contact Bob directly or to learn more about how Bob can advance you and your organization through leadership training, team building, executive coaching, and public speaking, visit robertpizzini.com. Robert, 
P-I-Z-Z-I-N-I.com and connect with him on LinkedIn.